the details of electromagnetic waves requires a minimum of physics 4b. And let me say that is the bare, bare minimum. It really requires an upper division of course in electricity and magnetism to really understand the details of what I'm stating. However, we want to take the same approach that we did to derive, to look at the wave equation and its solution. We didn't solve it, but we took the solution and we tried to explain the result physically. That's what we want to do again here. So I would then say that with that being said, I'll say that there are two pillars of physics in electricity and magnetism. I am not going to try to explain what I really want to do is that I just want to look at each of these very, very, very lightly to give you a sense of what we really need in order to understand what is an electromagnetic wave very lightly. So let's look at that. So we want to look at each of these two very briefly and go from there. So what we want to start off with is we'll start off with electrostatics. But we want to be careful when we say electrostatics. Electrostatics means that electric charges are either at rest or moving at constant velocity. And a lot of times people will say that this is electricity. I prefer the term electrostatics, but I'll leave it right there. So electrical phenomena is described by electric charge. Or electric charges and something called electric, which I will I'll typically abbreviate it with an E, electric field. And it's the electric field that we're really after. These guys, which come in two flavors. One of them is a positive charge. And the positive charge is really a proton, one of them is a negative charge, and this is what we call an electron charge. So now these guys interact with electric forces. So if I look at the forces, because I have two kinds of forces, I mean two kinds of electric charge, you're going to see that there's going to be two different types of forces. One force here is that I can have a positive charge interacting with a negative charge, or I can have two positive charges interacting with each other. So in other words, if I have positive charges like this, And then I have negative charges like this. What you're going to find here is that there are two electrical interactions. One of these shows that from that if I have a if I bring a positive and negative towards each other. This is an attractive force. 
On the other hand, if I bring a positive charge and a positive charge, they repel. If I bring a negative close charge next to another negative charge, this is repulsive. So if I have two types of electric charge, then I must have two types of forces. So what do we know here? From our course sense of reality, the electric force being a non-contact force appears magical. What do I mean by it appears magical? That means there are forces applied to the positive and negative charges that have no contact. But there is no such thing as magic in science. No magic in science. Something must communicate the non-contact force. Something. We say it is that it is the electric field that does that communication. So a field is a mathematical construct that says it has numerical value through everywhere throughout space. So I could then say that there are examples of fields. One, we could talk about a, a temperature. A temperature is a scalar field. That means everywhere there is a temperature there and it has a numerical value. It has no direction. On the other hand, we can also talk about the acceleration due to gravity is a vector field. The acceleration due to gravity, it has a magnitude, depending on its location on the surface of the Earth, as well as a direction towards the center. So if I look at this thing, I could then say that the electric field is the communicator. We typically don't say the communicator, we call it a mediator of electric forces between charges. So, so, so the E field connects two charges Okay, it, it connects two charges that tell it how to feel the electric force. So if I look at a single charge, let's say that I have a positive charge here.
one way of viewing this field here is that this field spreads out everywhere through space. And so I, this thing right here, this is known, these are right here, these are the field lines. And then this guy is the E field. So if a charge, if there's a second charge, that field then interacts with the field of the other charge here. So there's an important distinct, there's something important about this thing here. One cannot distinguish between an electric charge and its electric field. They are one and the same. I can't tell the difference between them. You can't strip an electron of its charge. And because of that, the charge is the cause of the field and it's always there. I can't make an electron bear. So saying an electric charge and saying the field is one and the same. So it's the electric field that I was really trying to get at. Mag Nito statics, which a lot of the times people call magnetism. In a similar manner, there are magnetic fields. So when we write the word magnetic, we symbolize this with the symbol B, not M. M was already taken. So when we write magnetic field, we call it a B field. So here we go. So the cause of an electric field is in electric charge. The cause of a B field is a moving electric charge. And there's two viewpoints of this. The first viewpoint that we should look at is that it turns out that there is a, this view that I'm showing you, this is a microscopic viewpoint So a microscopic viewpoint is a moving charge. But science is never that simple. You're going to see here is that the way people saw it macroscopically first, so a microscopic viewpoint, people could not see the moving charges the macroscopic viewpoint has 
magnetic poles. So that's what we're going to go for. We're going to go for magnetic poles. Why? Because it's very similar to electric charge. So there are two flavors of magnetism. And that means that there are that there are two different magnetic poles. So the way I'll look at it here is that I'm going to imagine that I have a little tiny bar magnet. And one side is going to be red. And the other one is going to be green. And I'm going to say that the red here is labeled the north end of the magnet. The green is the south. So this is the south pole, magnetic pole. And this here is the north magnetic pole. So now, in a very analogous way, I want to, I want to do the same thing with electric charges. So magnets experience two different forces. So one here, I can draw, let me see if I can put this together. So I'm going to have to show three situations. So I can have this scenario here. So in this situation, what you're seeing here is that a north and a south are next to each other. So what happens here is that these guys, because they're opposite, just like electric charges, this is an attractive force. Now I'm going to have to de I'm going to have to create another one here so I'm going to copy this guy. Now I need one the other direction. So let me redraw this. And this one I'm just going to reverse the poles so that this guy is now south here and this one is north. So now to get a combination of these I can now put these guys together here. So this guy looks like this, right? So now I can put two norths together and I can put two cells together now. So now if I go and I copy this guy, I can now reverse the order and I could put two north poles together or I can put two south poles together. And what you're seeing here is that these forces here, north and north, they repel. South and south, they also repel. So these guys are repulsive, very similar as before. Now, if you played with magnets, you already know that Magnetic forces are also non-contact. Which requires a mediator of the magnetic force via magnetic fields. So if you were to look at a magnetic field, here's something that we could draw here. So a magnetic field, 
and get my marker, my pen to work here. Let me try this again. I'm just going to try to paste this since I already have this. So a magnetic field is, it starts off at the north end and then it curves around on itself like this. And if you've seen images of the Earth's magnetic field, you'll see you'll see that it actually looks something like this here. So this guy right here is the magnetic field. And it's the magnetic field that we really want to describe briefly. So now, here we go. Here's the important detail. So the important detail is this, one electrostatic and magnetic, magnetostatic fields do not interact with each other. They're completely separated. And the reason why this happens here is that it tells us here because charges are at rest or moving at constant velocity. That's the reason why they don't interact. As soon as charges accelerate, it's completely diff different. As soon as charges accelerate, the electric and magnetic fields become entwined or intertwined. Um, like the dreadlocks of a Rastafarian, right? One cannot separate those knotted hairs. You just can't separate them. Analogously, one cannot separate E and B fields. In fact, a new field is created and this is called the electromagnetic field. It is a new field. It is different. And the reason why this is different here is that I would say that um, these fields that are entwined are now, listen to the word, coupled together. As far as light is concerned, 
That's the system of coupled oscillators we have been looking for. So now let's follow the same process as before. So now what I want to do here is that I want to apply the same process as before. So here's, that means I want a force equation. I want to derive a wave equation. And then I want, I want a wave solution. So here we go. So now our force equations are Maxwell Maxwell's equations. And there's four of them. Maxwell's equations are effectively the Newton's laws of electricity and magnetism. And there are four equations. I don't know. Should I write them? I don't know. One is the divergence of the electric field, the divergence of the magnetic field, and then there's the cross fields. Maybe I shouldn't have written this, but there are four equations that look exactly like this. Um, what is it? It's E. It doesn't really matter here. This is what matters. So now as I move and this, this is my force equation right here, right? This is my force equation. So as I move with my force equation, I'm now going to get the wave equations. And this is the way the wave equations look. These are four coupled equations. So then I get, I have a wave equation. Now note, because this is a vector, I have to have components. And then I get something that looks like this. And then I have a magnetic field wave equation. And so these are our wave equations. And so then finally, I get wave solution. So the wave solution means that I have two of them. I get a wave that then reads EY, and then I have an amplitude, and then I get, look at this, the exact same form. And if I look at the magnetic field, I get the exact same thing, but now it's just in the another direction. This is our electromagnetic wave right here. Okay, this is my electromagnetic wave solution. So this is following the exact same process as before. Again, we're not interested in the solution here. I mean, we're interested in the solution, but not how we derive it here. So now what I wanna do here is that I want to interpret this wave solution, okay? So now we wanna look at the interpretation. of the wave solution. Okay, so when I look at this thing, there's a couple of things that I want you to really pay attention to. Actually, I think I wanna show you first one of the waves. So what I'm gonna do here is that I have this electromagnetic wave. And what you're seeing here is that the red 
is the electric field. The blue is the magnetic field. And one of the things that you want to pay attention is that the electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular. And then this X direction right here, this is the direction of the wave. So let's go look at this thing. So let me go in back to my screen. And this is what we're seeing here. So one of the things that I just said here is I said this, electric slash magnetic fields are perpendicular. Oops. And the way we say perpendicular is we call this transverse. So it's transverse. They're transverse to each other. And the direction of the wave motion. Or I could have said wave speed. So if I if I paste in the image that I just showed you here, here's what you're seeing here. This guy right here, this here is an oscillating electric field. This guy right here in blue right here. This is an oscillating magnetic field. And one clearly sees that they're perpendicular. And then this direction right here, this is the direction of the wave speed, which is the direction of the wave motion. And because the disturbance is perpendicular to the wave motion, this is called the transverse wave. So because the disturbance of E and B fields are perpendicular to the wave speed, it's a transverse wave. So the electromagnetic wave is a transverse wave. So just to really stress this out, I'm going to imagine here that I have something like this. This is always hard to draw. So you're seeing here is that you're seeing this here. I'm seeing an electric field vary. So the electric field is varying. And then it changes direction and it starts to come back again like this. Now it's going to start to repeat. So this is the electric field. So when I look at the magnetic field, you're seeing that these guys are perpendicular. And they are also varying, but they vary in such a way that it's perpendicular. And these are the magnetic field, where once again, this is the direction of the velocity. That's what we mean by a perpendicular here. Now, there's something magical about this. And here's what we find. Mechanical waves are 
are in energy disturbance, in a wave medium. And remember, a wave medium is a system of coupled oscillators. Mechanical waves are an energy disturbance in a wave medium. And remember, a wave medium is a system of coupled oscillators. And this is really key to wave motion. Light is special because It does not need a medium to travel in. E and B fields are internally coupled. They're internally coupled oscillators and can be solo waves. Now note, this presents a really logical hurdle in the in the early parts of the 1900s and the reason why is because people were steeped in mechanical viewpoints all waves required a medium to travel through for example can you imagine water waves without water of course you can't but that's what people were steeped in you needed a medium in order to have wave travel, a system of coupled oscillators. Now, if I do, to just finish this up, we can then say the other thing that we want to interpret, the wave solutions give us the details of periodic motion. In other words, if I look at my solutions here, I have Kx minus omega t, or if I look at the, the B fields, I also have sine kx minus omega t, and we have already looked at these in detail already. That means sine kx minus omega t, what do they tell us about this? They, this guy tells us about what? This tells us about the wavelength. How are waves periodic? Spatially, omega, this tells us about the period. 
how are waves temporally periodic? Where we've already showed here that omega is equal to two pi frequency, two pi divided by the period. And the wave number k is equal to two pi divided by lambda. The third thing that we should look at here is that the wave speed is defined as this. So if I look at the wave speed, any speed is defined by the distance divided by the time. So what is the distance that a wave travels, you know, periodically? Well, it's got to be the wavelength. In that same distance, it takes that amount of time, but it turns out that we rewrite this to look something like this guy here. So in this case, it is customary to actually write it this way. So if when I look at this wave, this is the customary to write the wave. Okay, so I should say this, this is the customary way to write this. Now we'll get to the wave speed here in a minute here, but there's another way to derive this thing. So the technical way, the uh, wave speed is by looking at the wave e the the wave the wave equation so if you look at the wave equation that we saw before it looks something like this and that velocity is the cofactor of the second derivative with respect to time so now if i look at this guy again this guy right here, this by definition is the velocity of a wave. So now if I look at one of Maxwell's equations, let's say for the electric field, here's what we see. That we have a term that reads mu naught, epsilon naught, like this. So this tells me is that then this term right here is the wave speed as well of light. And so what we find here is that by comparison, we then see that the electromagnetic wave speed is this. It says that the velocity squared must be mu naught epsilon naught over one. So now we got to be careful here. This O right here, O stands for vacuum. Okay. But what you're finding here is that this becomes important here. These guys, these are constants, one associated with electric fields and one associated with magnetic fields. So what this tells us here is that now that the speed of light, which is a constant and they call it C, this speed of light in vacuum is equal to mu naught epsilon naught square root. And this guy is a constant that reads three times 10 to the eighth meters per second in one sig fig here. This guy is a very important number. 
And there's a lot attached to this thing here. But that is how you look at the wave speed.